When you're flying with four engines, things can get a little bit more complicated, but were these pilots at fault for all the destruction around the runway? Well, here's the full video. Even though I fly the 74, when I see it sometimes in videos, I'm like, man, that's such a large aircraft. If you aren't familiar, this is Minneapolis. I used to fly there at the regionals. I used to go there all the time. I've never flown there on the 747, but in the regionals, I used to go there all the time. I actually, the memories I have of it are always in the wintertime, having to do a walk around or being outside when it was so cold. I'd always think like, why would you live here? Because my, my grandfather, uh, he's from that area. And so I just don't understand why you would choose such a freezing cold place in the wintertime, but in the summer, it's a great place. As you can see, this was a 747-400. And from this angle, the easiest way to tell the difference between a 747-400 and a Dash 8 is these winglets right here. The Dash 8 has wings closer to that of a 787, and they don't have these types of wingtips. When I'm going to an airport that I'm not familiar with or I haven't been to in a long time, I do extra research. And one of the things that I make sure to research is different taxiway restrictions or runway restrictions that our plane may have. When you have a wingspan of a couple hundred feet, it can make a big difference. This is the chart here in Minneapolis Airport. And right here is the runway that they're taking off from, runway 17. And the runway is 150 feet wide and 8,000 feet long. This is the exact same chart in Miami, which you all know I fly to all the time. And it is also 150 feet wide, but roughly 13,000 feet long. Both runways have the same width. Obviously, the 747-8 has a little bit of a wider wing, and that can make a big difference. You can see here wingspan matters because all the way down the runway, the number four engine out here is actually throwing up grass and dirt behind it. The wingspan of a 747-400 is 213 feet, and on a Dash 8, it is roughly 225 feet, which in theory means that engine is gonna be a little bit further out. Now, I don't know the exact further distance it would be from the aircraft than a normal 747-400, and here's why I don't care. This chart in Miami is specifically designed for the 747-8, and it shows me all the runways and taxiways I can use when I'm taxiing the Dash 8. You can see here that runway 9 is actually an approved runway for use on the Dash 8. However, when we switch it here to Minneapolis, you can see that runway 17 isn't an approved runway for a Dash 8, but I suspect that is more due to the length of the runway than it is the width, because this is a much shorter runway by roughly 5,000 feet. I don't have the air traffic control audio from what was going on with this flight, but I'm guessing runway 17 was the active runway. Now, we researched on our chart to see if there's anything prohibiting us from taking off or taxing down a certain taxiway or a certain runway. And we also, as a backup, when we load everything into our computer to get our performance numbers of what speed we need to actually plan on rotating, getting off the ground, all that stuff, when we put everything in there, it is going to know how long that runway is and it will tell you, hey, you can't take off from that runway. So there's multiple checks, like I always talk about in aviation, to prevent you from doing something that you shouldn't be doing. Now, as you're approaching a runway to take off, the pilots will usually say, runway, there's a few different things. We might say runway 17 inside and outside. You might say on the glass and on the grass, meaning you're looking at on the ground to see it, and then the glass is the screen that we're using. There's a few different ways you could say it, but essentially you're gonna verify that the runway that you're planning to take off from inside is matching outside, so you're not taking off the wrong runway. That's the first thing you're gonna do. And then you're gonna look at the traffic coming inbound and outbound and see if there's any other planes that are coming that could be a factor to hit you as you were moving onto the runway. There's a few other checks, checking to make sure the speeds and everything is still the way it's supposed to be. So we do all of those checks before we get, or while we're moving onto a runway. One of the things that we don't check for is, 
is how new is the grass? How, how recently has this grass been laid down? That's not one of the checks that we do. When you watch this, you can see the actual rectangular chunks of sod actually blowing up, but the pilots have no idea that this is happening because we don't care about what's going on behind us. So these pilots did nothing wrong. It was an approved runway that they were allowed to take off from. They did everything that they were supposed to do, as far as I can tell, and they rotated and got off the ground. They probably didn't even know that they ripped apart all that grass on the runway there until they landed and, I don't know, these videos started showing up on the internet. So they probably had no idea. I doubt air traffic control said, hey, uh, you just destroyed half of the new sod that we laid down. And I'm guessing for the future, they'll if they lay down new grass, once it grows into the ground, it would never be a problem in the future. But the controllers will probably, if there's ever new grass that's put down over there, no, not to put a four engine jet on a takeoff there because our engines are hanging way off over, over the sides of the runway. Uh, our wings, like I said, 213 feet and the runway is only 150 feet. So you got a, quite a bit of distance hanging off both sides there. And when you rotate, your jet, is, your engines are going to be pointing towards the ground. And if your sod is just sitting there, well, it's going to rip it all apart, like you saw. I don't have any kids, but if I did, I probably wouldn't take them right into the departure path of an aircraft like this. It is a really cool shot, don't get me wrong, it looks really cool. I, I think it would be fun to stand there and watch the planes take off like this, so low to you and so loud, but it's not a great idea. You see this number right here? This is the stop margin, and what that means is that we get up to a speed, and at that speed it's a decision speed, whether we're going to take off or we're going to abort the takeoff. If we abort the takeoff, that's how many feet that we have remaining at the end of the runway before we go off the end of the runway. Now sometimes that number is two feet, sometimes it's 2,000 feet. It just depends on your payload. But not every airline in every country is going to be doing everything, let's call it honestly. Some of them may be more fluid as far as for what actual weight is on the plane because cargo planes make money based on the weight. So there have been instances where planes are overloaded and maybe the pilots don't know about it or maybe they do. There are times that pilots are put under pressure to take more payload than what the plane can realistically handle. So they'll put in fake numbers. Now, I don't do that because it's not worth it for me to risk my career or, or my life over something like that. And luckily in the US, if your airline was forcing you to do that, you would just go to the FAA and they would be in a lot of trouble and they would pretty much not be able to fire you. But in some countries, it doesn't really work like that. The government has more control over it and they may tell you, okay, uh, this is what's happening in my airline. And they go, yeah, well, we own the airline, so go fly it or we're going to fire you. And I'm sure that that's happened in a lot of different countries. When I watch this video, it looks like the plane rotated about a thousand feet down the runway, which I have done before. It looks like they crossed the threshold of the runway above 35 feet, so they're probably doing everything correctly. So there is really nothing that the pilots are doing that's incorrect here, but it is dangerous to be standing in the flight path of an aircraft that's large like this, not only for the stop margin, but also something like this can happen. This is a 747 Dreamlifter. It's one of the aircraft that I fly. We transport airplane parts on the inside of it. It's a special modified 747. And you can see this thing come off and that's one of our 747 tires. Those tires are huge and they're very heavy. I've taken you around on some of my vlogs where I do a walk around and I'm talking while I'm doing the walk around and you can see just how big these tires are. They are massive. And if you're standing at the approach end or the departure end of a runway and one of those tires comes off, little Timmy may not have the reaction skills to get out of the way. And one of those tires at that type of speed and how heavy they are, they would, they would destroy anything, a car, a building, it would crush it because they're very heavy and they have a lot of speed. So that's another reason why I wouldn't stand there. Yes, very cool pictures, probably not the best idea. The person who sent me this video asked if it was safe what was going on. I don't know if they were asking if what the pilots were doing is safe. And from the pilot perspective, yeah, the pilots aren't doing anything wrong. If people want to stand there, then we can't control that. They're outside the fence. But I don't think it would be a great idea. If you stood a little bit to the side from the, the plane, you're still at a risk because the plane could slide to the left or slide to the right, but you're at less of a risk than being right in the flight path of it. That's just my opinion. 
Flying small planes is a lot of fun because there are a lot less rules that you have to follow. The problem is that most of them don't have a bathroom. Videos like this are where the stories of Code Brown comes from because even though this pilot jumped out, didn't do any of his checklists just to run to the bathroom, he's better off to be remembered as the guy who forgot to do checklists and left the beacon running than the guy who Code Brown and his aircraft. You can see him as he pulls up right here, he shuts off the engine but this thing right here is the beacon and that's definitely on one of the checklists to turn that off because that indicates that the plane is still running. Now, if you've at least been through high school in your life, you know how uncomfortable and terrible it would be to be remembered as the guy who code browned his aircraft. That would be a horrible thing to be remembered for. So I don't blame this guy for forgetting to do the checklist and racing to the bathroom. That would be bad. People would remember you probably for a long time. That's not nearly as bad as what would happen if you were a U-2 pilot who also had a Code Brown situation, which is something that happens. As you can see, the U-2 plane is not very spacious and there is no toilet anywhere on this aircraft. Just the other day, I was flying with a guy who was a U-2 pilot and we were talking about, I was asking him all kinds of questions because it's cool to be able to talk to somebody like that. I, I don't know, when people come talk to me, they're like, oh, it's cool to talk to a 747 pilot. To me, it feels like, Whatever, it's just a normal job because I talk to other 747 pilots all the time. But a U2 pilot thought, wow, this is really cool. So I was talking to him and I was asking him all kinds of questions for the five hours as we flew across the ocean. He was probably just like, I want to get off this shift so this guy will stop asking me questions because I'm very persistent about getting information. Anyway, so I was asking him all these different questions and this topic came up because they're in these very special flight suits. They're very expensive. He said you're given two of them. Now, I said, well, what do you have to do if you go to the bathroom? Because these suits are special. Like in a normal fighter jet, you can go to the bathroom and there's, you know, it's pressurized, the cabin, but it's not a big deal. But in these flight suits and the U-2, it's not built like that. He said, well, there is a situation where guys have code brown in their flight suit. And if you do that, it, it is way worse than the happening in flight school because they put your name on a plaque on a wall. So your name is on a plaque on a wall. He, said, he says he's seen it. I kind of wish he'd taken a photo. I don't know if he's allowed to, but I'd love to see a photo of that. But I just can't imagine, like, the U2 has been around for a long time. So there's some pilots that are getting there, looking at somebody's name on the wall, and thinking like, oh, Kelsey, wow, he code browned a U2. And these guys maybe weren't even born when that pilot was flying that aircraft. I don't know. To me, that's just that's way worse than the flight school situation because once you get to flight school and get done, you disappear. A couple of people from the flight school are going to remember you, but your name's not on a plaque anywhere. So next time you see one of these U-2 planes flying around, just realize how much of their reputation they're putting at risk for flying one of these aircraft. If you enjoyed this video, check out one of these two over here. I look forward to hearing from you. Until then, keep the blue side up.